Hello, everyone, and welcome to our Saving Grace Good Friday service. We're very happy to have you here and watching. Um, so I'm just going to have a little opening prayer to start us off. Father God, thank you so much for this beautiful day, this uh, Good Friday where we can lift you up and worship you and praise you for what you've done for us. Thank you so much that, yeah, you've died on that cross and you rose again again so that we can have a relationship with you, we can be one with you. Thank you that you freed us from shame, from sin, from guilt. And now we can be filled with your, with your love and your life and we can share that to all of those around us. In Jesus' name, amen. So before we get started, just want to read a little verse or a couple of verses, actually, in Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 and 15. So it says here, Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity, so that by his death he might break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is, the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. And so it's this really beautiful picture of how Jesus seeing that, you know, we are flesh and blood humans and he didn't just stay up there in heaven, but he came down, came down to, um, to earth and had the same flesh and blood as us. He became human so that he could experience all that we experience. And he, he died um, to break the power of death that the devil holds and the, de- the devil held over us. So now we can be free from the fear of death. We can be free from sin, from shame, from guilt. And so, yeah, we're just going to be singing about how, you know, Jesus, how Jesus did that, how he died on the cross, how he broke the power of sin and death um, so that we can be free, so that we can live a life of, of fulfillment and joy and peace with God. So, yeah, let's just get started.
So awesome to be with you today on Good Friday. We just love to have you online watching us. We'd love for you to subscribe to our channel and hit the notification bell so that you can get updates from us when we're going online. Our Resurrection Sunday service will be at 10 a.m. this Sunday. It will be a live stream to YouTube on this channel you're watching now and on Facebook Live, and we'd love to see you there as well. Let's just pray. Lord, we thank you for this Good Friday message, we thank you for your presence with us right now. And we just pray that as we bring your word, that it would touch people's hearts, that wherever people are watching right now, that you just minister to them by your Holy Spirit 
and that this be a word that brings life and light into their hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to begin in Isaiah 53, verses 3 to 5. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain, like one from whom people hide their faces. He was despised and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. The cross in itself is just two pieces of wood, not even nice-looking timber, just rough planks designed for one thing only, painful death. This cross stands at the center of history, not because it is noble or beautiful, or even noteworthy. It's the center of history because of who died on that cross. And Good Friday is the day we remember when Jesus went to the cross for us. Isaiah tells us that he was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Yet he took up our pain and bore our suffering, and by his wounds we are healed. And even today, at this time, more than 2,000 years since his birth, we are still rejecting Christ. We're still choosing our own way instead of him. But he still calls out to us. And this Easter, he is calling out to you, choose me, choose life. Don't choose the world, don't choose death, choose life. The cross is not passive. It was not to be ignored. When you understand the cross for what it is, you have to make a choice. A choice to reject the cross or accept the cross. On January 13th, 1982, a plane crashed into the freezing Potomac River. On the plane was a man named Arlen Dean Williams. He was not a particularly impressive person. He had no great skills that would make him recognizable to anyone. He was divorced, the father of two children, a banker who had recently become engaged and found new hope in his marriage to be. However, some things happened this night, as we've read, and the plane crashed into the river. This man, this unremarkable man, his nickname at school was Chubb. And according to his girlfriend at the time, he had a fear of water. On this cold January day in America, Air Florida Flight 90 took off from Washington, D.C. However, due to a large amount of ice on the wings and strong winds, the plane smashed its nose into the 14th Street Bridge on the Potomac River. Destroying six cars, a truck, and taking four lives, the plane continued into the frozen river. It sank beneath the icy waters. All that was left was the tailpiece of the plane above the surface of the river. It seemed impossible that there could be any survivors from the crash. However, one by one, six survivors crawled out from the wreckage and clung to the tail of the plane. They had fractured arms or broken legs. Not one of them was unscathed by the crash. Just hanging on was agony as the freezing water began to claim, climb the tail of the plane. They were only 40 metres from the shore, but it may as well have been a kilometre. Chunks of shattered ice littered the water, making it impossible to get to them. One man attempted to swim from the shore with a rope around his waist to create a lifeline for the plane. But he got so cold and he began to sink that they had to pull him back to the bank. As the snowstorm began to increase in intensity, it looked like there was no hope for these six survivors. The tail of the plane was beginning to sink and time was running out. As darkness began to fall, there came the sound of a helicopter. Some mad pilot was going to try and rescue these six survivors. 
From the tropper, a rope with a life ring was dropped to a survivor. He happened to be our unremarkable friend, Arnold Dean Williams. Divorced, father of two children and recently engaged to be married, whose only claim to fame was his nickname Chubb and his fear of water. And this is when Arlen went from unremarkable person to hero. He passed the ring to someone worse off than him. The chopper rescued this person and returned to rescue Arlen. And again, he assisted someone else. Every time the chopper returned to Arlen, he assisted someone else with the ring. Eventually, there was no one left to pass the ring to. And as the chopper returned for its final run to rescue Arlen, he, along with the tail of Air Florida 90, slipped below the freezing waters of the Potomac River, dying a hero. It would be a year until his identity was known. The 14th Street Bridge was renamed in his honour as a memorial to his sacrifice. As Arlen had watched the helicopter approach, he realised that there was not much time left until the tail of the plane began to sink before it disappeared along with the survivors clinging to it. He was a banker. He understood numbers, profit and loss. He ran the sums in his head and realized that for, one to, for all to live, one had to die. God, from his eternal perspective as a perfect creator, looks at his creation and runs the numbers. He knows our sins, our wrong, our selfishness and our pride. He knows there is no way we can ever be good enough to make it on our own. For us to live eternally with him, someone else had to pay the price. Someone else had to die. Someone had to take our place. When we work, we get paid. Every action has a reaction. You commit a crime, you do the time. Sin, the wrong things we do have a consequence a wage associated with it. The Bible says that the wages of sin is death. God is a perfect God and in his presence, sin and wrong cannot exist. Perfection is out of our reach. Every day we prove that. There's no way we can be perfect on our own. So just as Arlen made a plan, God had a plan. And we read about this in John 12, 12 to 19. The next day, the great crowd that had come for the festival heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out in the streets shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it as it is written. Do not be afraid, daughter Zion. See, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. At first, his disciples did not understand all this. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realize that these things had been written about him and that these things had been done to him. Now the crowd that was with him when he called Lazarus from the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to spread the word. Many people, because they had heard that he had performed this sign, went out to meet him. So the Pharisees said to one another, See, this is getting us nowhere. Look how the whole world has gone after him. The whole world was celebrating the triumph of a king. Here was Jesus with all the signs of power entering Jerusalem. He was Jesus to deliver them from Rome. Just as Moses delivered the Israelite slaves out of Egypt, he was their savior coming to deliver them from the power of Rome. They were exultant in the thought of the coming battle. Some may die in the fight. Blood would be spilt. But they would throw off Rome from their back. They were right. There was going to be blood spilt. But Christ's kingdom was not to be written in the blood of his subjects, but in his own blood. John 12, 20 to 24. Now there were some Greeks among those who went up to worship at the temp festival. 
They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, with a request. Sir, they said, we would like to see Jesus. Philip went to tell Andrew. Andrew and Philip, in turn, told Jesus. Jesus replied, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly, I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. You see, the Greeks had heard the commotion. They wanted to see the king. But Christ was about his father's business, the business of death and sacrifice. Five days after Jesus entered Jerusalem in triumph, the very same crowd who had cheered him on now cried out for his blood. Crucify him, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him, they chanted. They wanted to see blood. They wanted to see the nails pierce his hands and feet. They wanted to see this false Messiah die. They had hailed him as king, and now they hawked for his death. But they did not understand that it was for this purpose that Jesus had come. Jesus had a secret ambition, one that could not be understood by the mob. He meant to give his life away. His whole life had been not to conquer Rome, but to conquer something much greater than Rome. The sin of the world, yours and mine. This journey, this road, this ambition did not begin in Jerusalem. It didn't even begin in Nazareth. It didn't even begin in a stinking stable in Bethlehem where Jesus was born. The journey to the cross began long before, as the echo of the crunching of the fruit was still sounding in the Garden of Eden. Jesus was leaving for Calvary, destined for the cross. He was the life that had to be sacrificed to spare mankind, to pay a debt he didn't owe because we owed a debt we couldn't pay. John 12, 31 to 32. Now it's time for judgment on the world. Now the prince of this world will be driven out. And I, when I'm lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. Jesus was saying that he was going to draw all judgment on himself. The hands that threw stars into space would now surrender to cruel nails. From the beginning of our rebellion... Christ chose to die. From the beginning of our rebellion, God still chose us. John 3, 16 to 18. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. This is how much God loved the world. He gave his one and only Son. He gave him for us. And this is why, so that no one need be destroyed. By believing him, anyone can have a whole and lasting life. God didn't go to the trouble of sending his son to point an accusing finger, telling the world how bad it was. He came to help to put the world right again. Anyone who trusts in him is acquitted. Anyone who refuses to trust in him has long since been under the sentence of death without knowing it. And why? Because of that person's failure to believe in the one of a kind son of God when introduced to him. And if you've never heard of Jesus and today you're watching him, I'm introducing him to you. Please don't reject him today. Luke 23, 32 to 47. Two other men, both criminals, were also led out with him to be executed. When they came to the place called the skull, they crucified him there along with the criminals, one on his right, the other on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. 
and they divided up his clothes by casting lots. The people stood watching and the rulers even sneered at him. They said, he saved others. Let him save himself if he is God's Messiah, the chosen one. The soldiers also came up and mocked him. They offered him wine vinegar and said, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was a written notice above him which read, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence? We are punished justly for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus Remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him, Truly, I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. It was now about noon, and darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. For the sun stopped shining, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. When he had said this, he breathed his last The centurion, seeing what had happened, praised God and said, Surely this was a righteous man. Choice. Choice is God's gift to us. You choose your eternity. Heaven or hell, you choose. You are either eternally with God in his loving presence, or you are eternally separated from his presence in hell. Max Licardo says this. In every age of history, on every page of Scripture, the truth is revealed. God allows us to make our own choices. And no one delineates this more than clearly than Jesus. According to him, we can choose a narrow gate or a wide gate, a narrow road or a wide road, the big crowd or the small crowd. We can choose to build on rock or sand, serve God or riches, he num- be numbered among the sheep or the goats. Then they, th- those who rejected God will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. God gives eternal choices, and these choices have eternal consequences. Isn't this the reminder of Calvary's trio? Ever wonder why there were two crosses next to Christ? Why not six or ten? Ever wonder why Jesus was in the center? Why not on the far right or the far left? Could it be that the two crosses on the hill symbolize one of God's greatest gifts? The gift of choice. The two criminals have so much in common. Convicted by the same system. Condemned to the same death. Surrounded by the same crowd, equally close to the same Jesus. In fact, they begin with the same sarcasm. The two criminals also said cruel things to Jesus. But one changed. One made a choice. One of the criminals on a cross began to shout insults at Jesus. Aren't you the Christ? Then save yourself and us. But the other criminals stopped him and said, You should fear God. You are getting the same punishment he is. We are punished justly, getting what we deserve for what we did. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus said to him, I tell you the truth. Today you will be with me in paradise. Much has been said about the prayer of the penitent thief, and it certainly warrants our admiration. But while we rejoice at the thief who changed, dare we forget the one who didn't? What about him, Jesus? Wouldn't a personal invitation be appropriate? Wouldn't a word of persuasion be timely? Does not the shepherd leave the 99 sheep and pursue the one that is lost? Does not the housewife sweep the house until the lost coin is found? Yes, the shepherd does, the housewife does, But the father of the prodigal, remember, does nothing. The sheep was lost innocently. The coin was lost irresponsibly. But the prodigal son left intentionally. 
The Father gave him the choice. Jesus gave both criminals the same. There are times when God sends thunder to stir us. There are times when God says blessings to lure us. But there are times when God sends nothing but silence as he honors us with the freedom to choose where we spend eternity. These five people clinging to the tail of that plane had a choice. They could choose to grab the life ring or they could choose to let it go and die in the icy Potomac River. There was no middle ground. You either grabbed the ring and lived or you didn't grab the ring and died. No middle ground there. No place to sit on the fence. When you know your life is going to end, you've got a choice to make. And they made that choice. But you don't know when your life will end. The world has seen this in the coronavirus, that no one knows what will happen, when our life might be taken. You might walk out today and not come home tomorrow. We don't know what will happen. But right now we can make a choice, an eternal choice. Just like the people on the plane made a choice, we can make a choice to live and not to die, to grab the life ring offered by God. Jesus was born in an obscure village, the child of a teenage peasant. He grew up in still another village where he worked as a carpenter until the age of 30. Then for three years, he was an itinerant preacher. He never wrote a book. He never held an office. He never had a family or owned a house. He didn't go to university. He had no theology degree or doctorate. He never traveled more than 300 kilometers from the place he was born. He did none of the things that we associate with greatness. He had no credentials but himself. He was only 33 when public opinion turned against him. Even his friends disrespected and despised him and rejected him. He was turned over to his enemies and went through the mockery of a trial. He was nailed to a cross between two thieves. When he was dying, his executioners gambled for the only thing he had left on earth, his clothing. When he died, he was buried in a borrowed grave. 2,000 years have come and gone. He is the central figure of the human race. All the armies that ever marched, all the navies that ever sailed, all the parliaments that ever sat, all the kings that ever reigned. Put together have not affected the life of man on earth as much as that one solitary life. Today, we mark time by his life. Every time you write the date, you declare that Jesus was a living, real person who came to this earth and dramatically changed our world. The cross divides time because Christ cannot be ignored. You either choose him or reject him, but that choice has an eternal consequence. 2 Corinthians 5.21 God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Acts 4.12 Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. And Revelation 3.20 Here I am, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. Will you take the lifeline? Will you open the door? Would you welcome Jesus into your life today? You see, Jesus came as a helpless babe and there was no room for him in the inn. So he was taken to a stinking stable and born there. And you are the innkeeper of your heart. You are the one that can open the door in your heart to Jesus or close the door and send him to the stable. Would you open your heart and receive Jesus today? If you would do that, 
Just repeat this prayer with me right now. Just close your eyes and just say this prayer. Dear Jesus, I come to you today and I open the door of my heart. I welcome you in. Jesus, I rejected you. I did so many things that were wrong. I hurt you. And I sinned against you. But I believe that you died on a cross for me. That you paid the price. You bore the consequence of my wrong. And I believe that God raised you from the dead. That you are alive and well. And Jesus, I open the door of my heart. Come into my life. Set me free. I want to serve you and live for you. Thank you, Jesus, that you did all this for me. And I receive you as my Lord and my Savior. And I will live for you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer, if you meant it in your heart, Jesus has come in and he will be with you all your life. His Holy Spirit, that's just simply the presence of God in a spiritual form, will be with you all the days of your life. He loves you so much and he has a purpose for you. He gave his life for you on a cross to pay that price that you might be brought back to God. And we would love to hear from you. We'd love to send you out some resources. We'd love to be in touch with you and help you on this new journey. Our contact details are below. You can call us or email us. We'd love to hear from you. We'd love to uh, just be in touch with you and, and know that you made that decision today. We love you. God bless you. Have a great week. And we'll see you on Sunday on our live channel on YouTube or on Facebook Live. God bless you. We love you. Goodbye.